So the second part that I'm dealing with this day is a study of the pre-tribulation rapture. The word rapture comes from the Latin word rapio. And you can find it in the Vulgate Bible. It's there. And the rapture in English is translated as snatched up or caught up. And it's found in 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 17, which reads, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. That's one of the major verses that deals with the rapture that we will be caught up. Those who have fallen asleep, those are the ones that have died, will be first. We are right after and we will meet Jesus in the air, in the atmosphere. That's where the meeting is. And it says from that point on, we will be with Jesus forevermore. Where he goes, we will go. But there are four prerequisites to believe the biblical account of the rapture. Four of them. The first one is that we need to believe in a literal interpretation. Plain interpretation like Jesus is our Savior. Plain. That's what we believe. We also realize that there is a figurative interpretation like when Jesus said, I'm the door, of course, he's not a wooden door. He, he says, I'm the entry to eternal life. It's a figurative interpretation. But overall, we believe in the literal interpretation of the word of God. That's very important and the basis of the rapture. Therefore, we believe in a literal snatching up or literal catching up of believers in the future. The second one of the prerequisites to believe in a biblical account of the rapture is called premillennialism. And uh, you need to put on your thinking cap for a moment because the meaning is pre, which means before, the millennium, which means the thousand year reign of Christ. So we do not live in the thousand year reign of Christ as some denominations do. Only premillennialism allows for the pre-tribulation rapture. With other words, if we are saying, oh, we are living in the millennium, in the thousand year reign, and of course it's only figurative because it's already been 2000 years, that does not allow the room for a pre-tribulation rapture. The third prerequisite uh, is to believe in the biblical account of the rapture that the church is not Israel. Very important. The church did not take over Israel and its promises. God has an end time plan for Israel. Antichrist taking over the temple and persecuting Jews worldwide. God, on the other hand, has an end time plan for the church, the rapture, the Bema seat, which is the judgment seat of Christ, and the marriage supper of the Lamb. And the last one of the prerequisites to believe in biblical account of the rapture is called futurism. What does that mean? Well, there are four views as to the timing. You have A, past tense. Those are called the Praetorists. They believe that the, um, the book of Revelation already happened and the fulfillment of it is already in the past tense and it has to do with the time of uh, right after the 70, year 70 when the Romans came and took over Israel. That's 
All of that happened back then, which of course we know is not true. Then B, you have the present tense or the historicist. And the historicist believes that we are actually living in the thousand years, as I have already mentioned. And so this is just all figurative speaking, the, the millennium kingdom, which of course we know is not true. And then C, future tense, the futurist. And that's what we believe, because futurism teaches that the rapture and the tribulation and the thousand year reign of Christ are still in the future. Therefore, we are the futurist of this list. And the last one is called D, the timeless. And the timeless are called the idealist. And the idealist believes that all of that is just to be taken uh, non-literal and therefore none of that is really important it, it's just uh, uh, the whole book of Revelation is nothing but the fight between good and evil and it's trying to describe it in its uh, s symbolic terms and that's it those are the idealists so we are called the futurists we believe in futurism it is yet to happen and we believe it will happen very very soon so those are the four prerequisites and that brings us to the 15 reasons for a biblical pre-tribulation rapture. Now I want to say first of all that the pre-tribulation rapture there is not a single verse in scripture where it says and the rapture will happen just prior to the tribulation period. There isn't such a verse. But neither is there a verse that says the rapture will happen halfway through the tribulation or the rapture will happen at the end of the tribulation or the rapture will happen just before the wrath, the, the great wrath starts. So all of this what we are talking about are indications of what we believe. And so we certainly allow others to have other views and there still are brothers and sisters and we can be in good standing with all of them but those are the reasons why we believe in a pre-tribulation rapture many people believe in a pre-tribulation rapture but couldn't give you a single reason why oh it's because the pastor believes it but that's not good enough let's look at the bible what does the bible have to say about the pre-tribulation rapture and so here are 15 reasons number one it's God's wrath that is coming. In seal number 6, in the book of Revelation, chapter 6, verse 15 through 17, we read this. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, the everyone else, both slaves and free, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us! and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb for the great day of their wrath has come and who can withstand it? That's God's wrath. In Colossians chapter 3 verse 4 and 5 we read this When Christ who is your life appears then you will also appear with him in glory. Let's talk about the rapture. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. So the wrath of God is coming, but we will be saved before the wrath appears. Praise the Lord. Second reason. Christ will keep us from the time of the tribulation. I want to share about the four last churches of the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and verse 3. There are seven churches, but the last four are the important ones that we are concerned about here in this study. So, A, we have the corrupt church. It started in 606 AD, and it talks about it in Revelation, chapter 2, verse 18 through 29. It identifies the Roman church the worship of Mary, the Pope, which is Papa, uh, who is supposed to be the representative of God on earth, the prayer to the saints, the dogma of purgatory, that we are saved by works, 
uh, that we are all God's children, even Muslims and witches, that baby baptism saves and the mass saves, all of those are untrue according to the Word of God. And so that is the, what we call the corrupt church. Then comes the dead church, Sardis. It started about 1520. We read about it in Revelation chapter 3, verse 1 through 6. And we are identifying many churches, not all of them, but many of the Lutheran, Methodist, Presbyterian, Anglican, and so on and so on. And here's some of their characteristics. The Bible says you have a name that you are alive, but you're dead. Uh, the Bible says, I have not found your works perfect or good enough. The Bible says, repent. The Bible says, you will not know what hour I will come upon you. So these churches are characterized by dead traditions, dead liturgy, and little biblical knowledge. And then we come, see to the faithful church. That's the important one. It's Philadelphia. We all want to identify with Philadelphia. It started about 1715, that type of churches. And Revelation chapter 3, verse 7 through 13 goes in great detail, but this is a church, it's the only one of the seven that has received a special promise. And listen to that special promise in Revelation chapter 3, verse 10, which says, since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial or tribulation that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. And there is the gate of that church, an open gate he has given us. For what? For evangelism. That church is characterized by evangelism, by people sharing the good news wherever they can. And uh, God says, I will keep you from the trouble of the tribulation, from the trials are yet to come. And then the final one, the end time church, it started around 1900. It comes out of Revelation chapter 3, verse 14 through 22. And here are the characteristics that the Bible tells us in the book of Revelation. Lukewarm, Christ will vomit you out. They think they are rich. They think they are wealthy, they need of nothing. But Jesus says, you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. They have need of a white garment to cover their nakedness. They need eyes off to see again. They're blind. Christ knocks on the door of that church. What is he? He's outside this type of church. More and more we see this type of church creeping up all over the world, not just America. And it's sad to see. It's like a club. Oh, we have everything. We don't need nothing. And Jesus says, oh, how blind you are. How naked you are. And Christ is outside. So those are the four type of churches. But... The faithful church, Philadelphia, which we said started around 1750, is the only church that has that special promise. Again, that promise is, I will keep you from the hour of trial or tribulation that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. What an incredible promise for us if we indeed are the Philadelphian church. If we indeed have a heart for the Lord and are witnessing and are used by the Lord and work for the kingdom of God, not for salvation, but as a grateful response to our salvation, I trust that's you and me. Let's go on to the third reason for the pre-trib. Christ's coming is our blessed hope. That's Titus 2, verse 11 and 13. And we read, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly pleasures and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in the present age while 
we wait for the blessed hope. We wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So in other words, we wait not for the signing of the contract by many nations with Israel. We wait not for the coming of Antichrist. We wait not for the tribulation period, but we are waiting for the blessed hope of the appearance of Jesus our Savior. Let's go on to number four. In Genesis 18, Lot and his family were delivered from the flaming judgment of God on wicked Sodom. God didn't protect them in the midst of judgment. He removed them from the time and place of the judgment and took them up into the hills. And so what do we see? They are fleeing from uh, the judgment. In 2 Peter 2 verse 6 through 9, we read, If he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued Lot, a righteous man, who was dressed by the depraved conduct of the lawless, for, this, for that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds and saw and heard, if this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials or from tribulation and to hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. And so God is saying he, he will keep us from the trial or from the, uh, the, the, the terrible things that are going to come uh, in the tribulation period. He keeps us from it and he holds the unrighteous for punishment on a day of judgment. The word, the word trials is the same word for tribulation in the original language. Let's go on to number five, Enoch's example. In Genesis 5 we read about Enoch. His story is interesting because he never died. God simply took him one day. This occurred prior to the flood, which was God's judgment on a rebellious world. Someone might counter by asking, what about Noah? He too was righteous, but he went through the flood, being protected by God in the ark. Isn't that a better picture of God protecting the church during the th uh, and through the tribulation? No. Noah isn't a picture of the church. He's a picture of God's sovereign protection of Israel during the tribulation, a subject that gets much coverage in the book of Revelation. Noah pictures Israel, while Enoch represents the church, which is raptured prior to judgment. Isn't that interesting? Israel is not snatched up before the tribulation, but God provides a hiding place for them. There is an Old Testament prophecy about that. It says in Isaiah 26 verse 20, Go, my people, enter your rooms and shut the doors behind you. Hide yourself from a little while, for a little while, until his wrath has passed by. So there is a wrath coming, it's called the tribulation, but I am going to keep you from the worst. How do I know that? Well, because of Revelation 12, 6, where we read, the woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. Now the woman, in context of this verse, is Israel. The place is Petra, and the time is three and a half years. The second half, the two, 1,260 days. The worst of the worst, taken care of, hidden away. Not taken out like the Christians, but the Jews are protected on the earth throughout the worst time. 
We look at number six, Daniel's example. Where was Daniel when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in the fiery furnace in Daniel chapter 3? Daniel is foreshadowing the mystery of the rapture of the church. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego represent Israel and how God preserves them during the fiery trial of the tribulation. Daniel is absent. An absence picture of the church absent from the very hour of trial. An interesting comparison. Number seven, we are to pray for an escape. Did you know that? The seven years of tribulation comes from God's hand. He orchestrates it. He planned it. It's his wrath. And Jesus already paid for us and for our sins on the cross, right? In Luke 21, 36, Jesus said, Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man, Jesus. A pre-trib rapture isn't escapism. It's the reason that Jesus told us to look and pray so that we'd be ready to go. Praise the Lord for that. Number eight, the message from God to Daniel. Seventy weeks are determined for your people, the Jews, and for your holy city, Jerusalem. That's Daniel 9 verse 24. The main purpose of God for the tribulation is to bring the Jews to a saving knowledge of Jesus. Christians are already saved. The tribulation is not for us. At the end of the tribulation, the remnant of the Jews, which by the way will only be about one third, according to Zechariah 13, 8, will be saved. The same in the book of Romans. All the Jews at that time, the remnant, will be saved. In Jeremiah 30, verse 7, the tribulation is called Jacob's trouble. Not the Gentiles' trouble, Jacob's trouble. And remember the name Jacob was changed to Israel. It's Israel's trouble. The whole tribulation time over the whole earth is Israel's trouble. Remember that. Number nine, the outline of the book of Revelation. The things John had seen, past tense. The vision of Jesus in chapter one. Then the things which are, present tense, chapters 2 and 3, messages to the seven churches. Those seven churches represent seven eras of the church age, including right now, present tense. And thirdly, the things which will take place after this. After what? After the church age, chapters 4 through 22. After these things, the events of chapter 2 and 3, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. And so we see in this uh, number 9, the outline of the book of Revelation clearly states that the church age is over and after this the come up here comes which represents of course the rapture and i will show you the things that will take place after this number 10 the church is absent from earth in the tribulation the word church ecclesia used 18 times in chapter 1 2 and 3 but it is not even used once after that until the very end of Revelation. Chapters 6 through 19 describe the tribulation, but do not once mention the church, the ecclesia, because the church isn't on earth. It's in heaven. Chapters 4 and 5 describe the church in heaven worshiping God and and the Apostle John had the privilege of going there and watching what will happen 
after this and what did he see the 24 elders so again a clear sign that the absence of the church the ecclesia throughout the tribulation period points to the rapture as being pre-tribulation rapture number 11 unknown time of christ's return daniel 9 spells out clearly that there will be 1260 days from the time the antichrist enters the temple in jerusalem and declares himself god small g till the return of jesus christ yet matthew 24 36 makes it clear that no one knows the day of jesus return therefore both the mid and the post tribulation rapture are impossible because we could figure out to the day when the mid starts and when the post starts because of the signing of antichrist um, and halfway point uh, of that because the days are given to us a thousand two hundred and sixty days number 12 the rapture is imminent the apostles and the early church all believed in a pre-tribulation rapture we know that because they believed jesus could come at any moment yet they knew they weren't in the tribulation in all other views, we would be pre-warned of the rapture because we would be in the tribulation ourselves. And so the imminency is important. It could happen at any moment and we need to be ready. Number 13, the Holy Spirit removes the Christians before the appearing of the Antichrist. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 7 and 8 says, the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way and then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord, himself, Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth. The one who holds it back is the Holy Spirit. He's God, the Holy Spirit, the only one that's powerful enough to hold back Satan. Holds back, it holds back the lawlessness. Of the Antichrist and of Satan taking out of the way the Holy Spirit in us when the Holy Spirit goes we go and that's the rapture number 14 the 12 24 elders in Revelation chapter 4 verse 4 represent the church in Revelation 4 verse 4 the 24 elders are wearing the crowns which they received at the judgment seat of Christ or the Bema seat the judgment seat of Christ happens right after the rapture. Yet we are seeing a scene long before the beginning of the opening scroll of the scrolls, which is the beginning of the tribulation. Therefore, the rapture has to be before the tribulation, simply because the representatives of the New Testament are already wearing the crowns. And the scroll hasn't even been opened yet. The tribulation hasn't even begun yet. And number 15, the example of the Jewish marriage ceremony. The Jewish marriage ceremony is one of the most beautiful illustrations of the rapture. In John 14, Jesus spoke some incredibly comforting words. He said, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Being a 21st century Christian, Gentile, we miss out on how the original disciples would have heard and understand this. Jesus used the terminology of a Jewish wedding. And so that's what we want to look at. What was a Jewish wedding like? Well, this is what it was like. Once a man and woman were betrothed and the price of the bride was paid. So there was a price to be paid. He would return to his father's house, just like Jesus did, and add on a new room. There'll be a new room. 
when the room was nearing completion, he'd send a friend to tell the bride the time for the wedding was approaching. We are near, we are close. She would get ready, but rarely knew the precise moment of his arrival. It was part of the suspense and romance of every of the event that she waits without knocking, knowing the precise hour of his arrival. Her dress is ready to be slipped on. She's all ready. But finally, the day would come and the groom would go forth and claim his bride. His friends went with him and made much noise, blowing trumpets and shouting to let everybody know the time of the wedding had finally come. Behold! The bridegroom comes. When the groom arrived, there was a huge feast, the wedding supper. In Revelation 19.10 we read, Then the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. After the meal, the man would take his wife into the new room he'd made, and they would stay sequestered there for, note this, seven days. John 14, 3 says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. This is how the rapture will occur. We are now betrothed to Christ, and he has gone to prepare a chamber. We do not know the day or hour of his return, but we do know the time and seasons because he sent his friends the prophets to describe them. When the time is ripe, he will come accompanied by much noise. Then he will take us to the marriage supper of the Lamb and will be sequestered with him in heaven for the seven years of the tribulation. When he comes again, emerging from heaven in glory, we come with him and rule and reign for a thousand years. What a glorious event! that will be and so my friends I want to leave you with a wonderful piece played in Bern Switzerland that this is not the end in fact that is just the beginning please listen Lord bless you all and thank you for watching for some 20 years many of you I love you and pray that God will reward you richly. Lord, we thank you for the time we spent together over this time period. May this be a blessing as we listen to the wonderful words of this song. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.
Mentega Zeit.